you cloud. Hello everyone, my name is Errol Bennett. I am the Research Project Manager at Tools, Practices and Systems. Uh, this week, and I am also a Book Dash Committee Planning member. Um, this week I've mainly been working on the Research and Infrastructure Roles chapter, which I'm excited to demo. Um, and are we going to do icebreaker, the, ice, the response to the icebreaker question as well? Or I we'll think just we, leave that. I for... think we will probably run out of time because we've got yes. quite a few share ups as well. But the That's icebreaker cool. folks can add in the to the hack and dig the computer. I will pick Alejandro to go next and introduce himself. Uh, hi there, I'm Alejandro. I am postdoc at the Turing and I my my background is in physical geography, but this thing of open science I, and uh, all the stuff that we are doing with the Turing Way is very exciting. So I have my first boot dash and thank you, Christy and everyone of the Turing that in, uh, introduced me and in, say joined to the community. I'm very happy. And I was working mostly in the translation because it's a topic that I'm being collaborated with Camila, the Turing as well, trying to do in Spanish. But now with uh, Batu, we discovered that a new technology that is can accelerate the translation to multiple languages. So very excited uh, also this part that we were working with with then and Andrea as well. Yeah, I guess I'm gonna pass to, I don't know, uh, uh, who is there, Jessica? <laughs> Hi everybody, uh, I'm Jessica Scheich. I am at the University of New Hampshire in the US. Um, my background is in glaciology and I do a lot of work in uh, software development as well. And that's what brought me to open science and the Turing Way. And uh, the work I've been doing with the Turing Way has revolved a lot around uh, the GitHub chapters and materials and how to help. Um, so I've been doing some reviewing of those and adding some interactive resources um, in an effort to help other scientists uh, learn how to effectively contribute uh, do open science and collaborative development. Oh, who would I'm, like uh, you, you can say. either pick someone or someone can volunteer because we'll start to get to the point where people are picking on people who've already said hello as well. Who would like to go next? Uh, I can go next. Uh, I'm Martin O'Reilly. Uh, I lead a research engineering group here at Turing. Um, so we sort of do a lot of software development and data science and other researches. Um, I was still quite involved in some of the early work on the feasibility of Turing, but I've been embarrassingly uh, remiss at contributions to the Turing way, uh, which I keep them to remediate. Thank you, Martin. Malvika, well, if Malvika is able to introduce herself, I'm going to pick on her next. Hi, everyone. I am Malvika. I am a well, research, senior researcher at the Tools, Practices, and Systems. Still oh, used so to, fine. not used to saying this. I'm also co leading the Turing Way project with Kirsty. And uh, I'm, I'm sitting in Denmark and sipping on wine, and I'm really excited to be here. Thank you very much. Um, I'm pulling names out of a hat a little bit now. So if you've already said hello, then, or you don't want to, then um, feel free to just tell me that and correct. Andrea, go, yes. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Andrea Sanchez Tapia. I'm a Colombian biologist. I am based in the US right now. And I have a background in uh, ecology, community ecology and um, biodiversity informatics. And this week is, I have been participating in my First book dash, uh, and with Batulena Alejandro, we have been working on the translation workflows to make them sustainable in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to pick on Nick next. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Nick Barlow. I'm in Martin's team, uh, research engineering at the Turing. Um, I'm afraid I haven't really done anything at all on the Turing way. I'm more or less just like joining the session to eavesdrop and hear about all the great progress that's been made and just purely out of interest. Um, so yeah, I'm sort of an uh, interested observer, I guess. You do do a decent amount of open science and reproducible research in your day job. So oh, yeah, there is that, yeah. <laughs> He's definitely a, a highly informed observer <laughs> for this session. <laughs> 
Um, I think, uh, Camille, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, Ariel. Yeah, hi. Uh, sorry, I am not, my video is not on. It's, it's lunchtime here in New York City where I am. Um, I'm Camille Santa Steven. I'm with the Center for Scientific Collaboration and Community Engagement. And I'm a social scientist by training, and I'm just really curious to learn more about re research infrastructure roles and what y'all do, because it's not something that I'm super familiar with. But kind of like Nick, I guess I'm an interested observer, um, and I'm really excited to see what comes out of the book sprint. And because um, we're, I'm always looking for resources to better understand the open science ecosystem. So thanks for for having me. <laughs> awesome, and welcome. Uh, we're glad to have you here. I think I've got Martina and Esther who have not introduced themselves in some way, shape or form, or, or would like to introduce themselves in, one, in some way, shape or form. Is anybody else thinking, oh, and Emma, right, okay, great. Right, it's Martina, oh yeah, and then Kirsty, you go last. And Batul, <laughs> Batul can go last, Batul. sorry. <laughs> it's confusing because we did it in like three different sections. Was, did, you, did you pick up Martina? Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Martina. Sorry about the camera too. Um, I'm a PhD student in neuroscience living in Germany, and I have not participated in this current book dash I did on previous ones, and had a very busy year and haven't been participating in the two-way community gatherings for a while, so I thought attending this event might be a great way to catch up with what's been going on with the project. Nice to have you here, Martina. Esther, would you like to? Hi, everyone. I'm Esther. I'm a data steward at the Delft University of Technology, which is in the Netherlands. And I have been uh, one of the co-organizers of the Book Dash this week um, as part of the planning committee, uh, which was very nice. And I'm very happy and excited to be here today. Thank you, Esther. Emma, take it away. Hi, I'm Emma. Um, I work at the Alan Turing Institute as a community manager, and I'm also part of the um, Book Dash planning committee. And yeah, I'm excited to see all the things that have been going on this week. Wicked. Um, Marta, you have just joined us. Um, I understand that you might have some technical issues. So if you want to unmute and say hello, please do. Hi, hi everyone. I am Marta. I, um, I work as a teaching fellow and research assistant in psychology at the University of Leicester. This is my third book dash at the beginning of the week. I, um, I managed a small, a small discussion on data visualization and I started writing a chapter on it. And I've just shared it, shared it with Emmanuel as well. And, um, if you, um, I don't know if we do like the show and tell now or later. It'll now. be later, we're, we're just, no, no, we're just doing Okay, good, because at least we'll have time to, to open it and everything, hoping that my computer doesn't crash on me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm really excited to see what everyone has been up to. <laughs> me too. Okay, great. Uh, Kirsty, I think you're next. Yep, yep, I think it's me. And then I will hand over to Batul and Batul, you can introduce yourself and then smoothly, no problems at all. It's gonna look super slick going to the, the demo section. Uh, so hi everyone, I'm Kirsty uh, Whitaker. I'm the program director for the tools, practices and systems research program at the Turing Institute. And I also started the Turing Way a few years ago and now I co-lead it with Malvika. Um, and I have been, quote unquote participating in this book dash. I spent quite a lot of time joining from my phone uh, whilst on dog walks and kind of casually listening in to fascinating discussions. Um, and it was it was really, really fun. Uh, I want to sort of particularly shout out the, the translation team for allowing me to listen in to their work, uh, which as a monolingual English speaker, um, there's no part of me that would be able to do all of the amazing work that they're doing and it makes me feel so so proud and so excited to be part of a community that's thinking so broadly and so inclusively about um supporting and helping others to 
work reproducibly and ethically and collaboratively. Um, so I'm super, super proud to be here. It's a brilliant way to end the week. And just thank you to everyone for the ideas and the hard work and the reviews and helping each other out. Um, one of the things that we said quite a lot this morning in the, the first share out was recognizing how many contributions to the Turing Way do not actually appear as lines on the git commit history in the Turing way because you're it's the reviews it's helping people to get set up it's answering questions it's brainstorming um and those are those are just really uh, joyful for me to to witness and um be part of so thank you everyone but we'll take us take us forward Oh, thank you, Christian. Thank you so much, Ariel. So I am Batul al Marzouk. I am a computational biologist affiliated with Kay Markia in Saudi Arabia. I'm speaking right now from Spain. Uh, I'm also one of the Bukdash Planning Committee. Uh, and I'm working in the translation chapter with Andrea and Alejandro. So we reached, this is the chair out, like the most exciting part of the, all the Bukdash. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna start with the first one. I'm gonna just go through the order I have in my screen right now. I don't have any particular order. So I'm gonna start with Ariel. Okay. Hello. <laughs> You thought you'd seen the last of me. Uh, I am going to share my screen super quick. There we go. Okay. Can ev can everyone see my screen? Yeah, we can Wonderful. see it. Perfect. Okay, fantastic. So um, what I want to highlight here is that we have, um, we're, I've been working on this week has been um, a massive um, new addition in terms of, sorry, I'm going to have to stop sharing a second because my um, something is playing music on my laptop and I can't work out what it is. And I think it might be Spotify. Can you, imagine if we, can you imagine if we put that in as a very like 90s throwback for the Turing Way website? So just sort of have like some, some dancing, colourful um, text bouncing around and also a little bit of elevator music rocking along in the background. Be great. <laughs> what a oh feature. My but it was playing, it was playing like a two second clip of some like background jazz. And it just, even if you guys couldn't hear it, I could, it was driving me mad. Um, right. Okay. Now I can actually, now I can actually share with everyone. Um, I hope you can all see my screen and it says research in infrastructure rules on it. So this is a topic that I, I've wanted to write a bit about for the Turing Way for, um, uh, quite some time. It is about acknowledging the work that um, a lot of people do in and around research with, with a set of highly technical skills um, that overlap with, but are not sort of totally um, in conjunction with um, pure academic researchers. They often do their own research, contribute to policy, um, you know, uh, like support um, the technical side of research. Um, they might be leading their own grants, giving their own talks. Um, they play like really, really critical roles in terms of connecting people, sharing best practices out. Um, but for a long, long time, the people that were doing these roles weren't very, much, weren't very well acknowledged. This is changing significantly now. Um, with initiatives such as the Software Sustainability Institute, the Research Engineering, the Society of Research Engineering, the Mills Organization, which is the Center for Scientific Collaboration and Community Engagement. Um, and I also think it's important to have them represented in a Turing way because um, it's a place that such a lot of people come for advice and guidance. It's also a really good place to demonstrate that um, you don't always have to be what we might stereotypically think of as a researcher to be interested in best practices for collaboration, for reproducible research, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is sort of the underpinning philosophy of this. I started out the week very optimistically thinking, oh, we'll get loads of overviews up. They will be, um, they will be lots of fun and um, then we'll start adding case studies. Um, that was overly optimistic, so we haven't quite got the um, five roles up that I wanted to get up uh, in, in terms of overviews, but that just means there's more for people to contribute later on. Um, so we have the community managers overview, 
And this contains sort of a bit of a brief description of, of what community managers actually do, what qualifications or skills do you need to be to be a community manager. Um, and I want to shout out that there's the CSCCE skills wheel here that goes into a lot more detail on like the different skills that is required for, for this particular role. Um, the challenges for community managers, benefits to having community managers in your organization, and then organizations that support community managers as well. Um, so that's the same for data stewards, um, which I will just scroll through here. Um, and also the research software engineers. This one, I'm gonna like look at Nick and Martin in particular um, with like a little beady eye because this one is not as detailed as the ones that um, myself and uh, Esther who wrote the data stewards overview um, did. Um, so that one is very much there for expansion and revision and, uh, oh, you forgot about this entirely critical part of, of this role. Um, so please take that away. And the hope is in the future that um, we will have people contributing their case studies. I'm going to leave uh, the case study because that's actually uh, Esther's case study and I'd like her to show that because that's, that's her work, entirely her work. Um, and also add new kinds of types of roles with like a brief overview as we we have um, time. Um, my next one will be a project manager um, overview. And I think we also want to include the research application managers in there as well that some of you are familiar with. Um, so that's that's pretty much it for me in terms of what I wanted to share out. Um, I also had a, a lot of fun um, helping everybody who was new and uh, was working on other stuff. I had chats about open access. I walked people through how to get stuff on to Git. And um, yeah, just had a lot. I always have a lot of fun like seeing people take stuff and run with it at book dashes. Um, and to, this time was no exception. So thank you very much. And that's the, that's the end of my share out. Wow, 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 incredible. I don't know how you managed to do the all of that Ariel I mean that's so inspiring wow amazing <laughs> I'm blown away uh so I'm gonna go to the next one unless anyone got questions I think we're gonna go through the question at the very very end uh so the next one gonna be actually the translation team so Andrea and Alejandro if you want to guys start and I'm gonna help out at the very end do you want to start Andrea first yeah Andrea go Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I will be sharing my screen here and I will let you I will tell you how we went this week. So uh, we we had a uh, lot of discussions with Batul and Alejandro this week and uh, the overall um, spirit of the translation team was that translation is key for globalization, for true inclusion and globalization. We want uh, people who want to collaborate in the Turing Way community to be able to step in and, uh, and uh, collaborate with pre-existing teams or to have well-documented workflows so that they can start new languages if they, if they want, uh, if they have a community that they want uh, to share the knowledge that, that the guide that is in the Turing Way um, in their language, that's, that, that's what, that's, the main reason for documenting this workflow. So we have um, we have a, a PR. I, I am starting from the end because I want to show you the, the preview of the PR. So we would have a new translating the Turing Way um, chapter in the community handbook where we want to, to document uh, everything. And um, a part of what we worked, I, I want, uh, I know that Alejandro is going to speak later, but Part of what we have is that we have uh, uh, two teams, two large teams happening at the same time. We have the Spanish translation going on in Transifex. Alejandro has been working on that. And uh, we are discussing to, to migrate, uh, whether to migrate to crowding. And crowding has uh, already a project uh, set up with some tentative languages. And um, it has the advantage that it will make some machine translation automatic so you can spend your energy in revisions rather than in uh, translations from from scratch uh, so we're documenting this step this should be easy for anyone to step in we want to to emphasize that you don't have to be a perfect english speaker a person who is super fluent in english to do the translations because 
your work is doing the translation and make it sound good for your language. So uh, we have a crowding account set up by Batul and she has been communicated with crowding team. And uh, we have lots of the of, uh, discussions during this week. Um, and uh, part of the of the, our team uh, is uh, the technical part that Batul uh, wrote and she might want to uh, complement later. Uh, about localization platforms and translations, but also Alejandro was uh, documenting the team part, the, the how to work when you have the workflow. Uh, so I think I'm going to leave it for now, but I wanted to give you this overview for this. Okay, yeah, just to, uh, something similar, just to, uh, as you see, we have this first, like, uh, a kind of approximation what the what the uh, how the translation uh, I don't know if you see my screen now can yes. you confirm yeah yep. so one thing that probably <laughs> that we have this previous uh, like figure uh, sorry the illustration here in the translation uh, sorry I'm trying to find here collaboration or where are I? sorry we are here in translating. Yeah, just to say that we have the this previous illustration, but part of also of the wood dash, we have a new illustration that basically we have this session with Katia and we add some components of this localizator platforms that are common between the different ones, but basically uh, with the experience, so we have a tool that have very successful translated projects, so we can in somehow uh, put the main elements that we have here. Uh, so we have here the people, the community, and you can see how we have this machine translation that uh, now you can have different languages and so on. So that was great to have this new illustration. And it's something that people can use uh, later in other projects, I guess, because it's very great uh, having this uh, kind of illustration. And I don't know if Batul is gonna go through this localization platform, but she have a kind of uh, main descriptions of each of the features. And at the end, she made some bullet point with uh, the samples. Of course, uh, the, the new one that we are potentially using is this one crowd in uh, because it's very efficient, the way that it's gonna help to translate many languages as uh, Andrea say. And uh, from this, is, this test was especially adapted uh, from the learnings that we have uh, with the Spanish translation team. And basically it's like kind of workflow that we were doing with Trans transfers, but in somehow it, these steps are the steps that are usually we found relevant in any translation project. So basically, we have some new new tests like explaining what people need to consider before translation, and this is almost what you need to do while you are doing uh, you are starting your translation project. Then during translation, and after translation. We have some bullet points like people need to do periodical reviewings and improve the translation, update the glossaries, and so on. So there are plenty of uh, room for improvement in these aspects, but I guess we may, in overall, a great job. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Batula, are you back? Fabio. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Uh, it's like my Mac crashed suddenly. Just shut down uh, sorry for that guys uh, and thank you thank you Alejandro I, I mean I was super super lucky that I worked with Alejandro and Andrea I can't describe how heavy I was like working with them I've learned a lot a lot working with them uh, I think they've shown pretty much everything have you guys shown the workflow and crowding as well right uh, yeah, so, so they've gone through everything. So thank you guys. So the next one that we're going to go through is Emma, I believe, with Marta. If I'm not yeah, with Maria. Yeah, Maria yeah. with Maria. Yeah, yeah, with Maria. Sorry. Yeah. Hello. Oh. So uh, so Maria's still having technical problems, but she's going to post something in the chat if I forget to say something. Basically. So, um, so um, we had a quite uh, so Maria and I have been working on um an overview. Um, sort of to start um, a chapter about sensitive data that is going to link with other bits and pieces that people have already written, such as Esther has written about personal data. Um, uh, Maria has been writing about how to deal with data in GitHub when you're using sensitive data. 
And then we've also got Ed from um, the Reg team at the Turing has been writing about using um, data safe havens. So we're going to try and sort of get all of this information about sensitive data and working with sensitive data and also managing sensitive data projects all kind of in one place. So our aim was to write um, an overview of um, this chapter uh, for this chapter. Um, we did a lot of planning, I have to say. So I'm just going to share my screen and show you what we sort of got up to this week. Um, so we had a lot of discussions um, and we've done, we've done quite a lot of planning. We did a lot of reading at the beginning of the week. Um, and so we've sort of managed to get to form the basis of our chapters um, and we're starting to work on them. So Esther's already written a lot on personal data. So Maria has, she's really been coordinating all of this and bringing everything together. So she's been working to find out what we need and what we what we still need to write and what we can link in already. Um, and uh, I've been working on um, uh, about biological data. I think Andrea might be a good person to add to this actually, if she's talking about biodiversity data, because that's what I've been researching and writing about this week is um, sensitive biological data. And most of it's biodiversity data. So I've written a, a sort of a first draft of that um, section, but it needs expanding. Um, and then Maria has been filling in about um, combinations of different types of data sets and also filling in where we're going to um, uh, put in everybody else's work. So we've still got quite a lot to do. I think it's going to take us a little while to get all this filled in, but we've got a really good sort of skeleton of the chapter now, which I think I'm really pleased about. Um, so yeah, so that's what we've been up to this week. Um, and also, um, yeah, I've been reviewing quite a lot of pull requests yesterday so I'm really was really happy to read everyone's amazing work like Ariel's chapter um also um uh, Nina's chapter I really enjoyed reading that that self-reflection that was really lovely to read so yeah I really enjoyed it so thank you to all of you because it's been a lovely week wow this is awesome thank you Emma I mean I love the hack and how is it organized you know how to organize things like yeah <laughs> That's, so well, that's Maria. Maria's done all of that. So <laughs> I'm getting her lots of credit. Maria, she's, really, she's been coordinating it. Um, Maria, do you want to add anything about what Emma said or anything? But you still have problems with technology. If you want to add anything. Still, yeah. yeah. But if I, you want to add anything in the chat, just yeah, let me know. I'm going to read out loud. So the next person is, um, is it Jessica? If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it's Jessica. Go on. Thanks, Patul. Um, so I was working with uh, Lena. Well, I had my fingers in a whole bunch of different pies this week. Um, so did a little bit on a lot of things. Um, the the thing that uh, has something most interesting. Well, I guess I shouldn't say that. Um, the thing that I'm currently uh, sharing with you guys is some of the work I've done with Lena on uh, peer review. So she was interested in putting together a chapter um, on peer review in particular uh, guides for peer review when you're asked to peer review a journal. Um, but one of my goals for the week was to also start working on how to do uh, pull request reviews on GitHub um, and why they're important, uh, et cetera, and so on. And so we shared a lot of ideas on the general ideas of peer review. Um, there should be an awesome Scriberia image coming soon. I don't know where to find that or how to add it. Um, but uh, uh, so we started talking about what the general process of peer review is, why it's important, uh, what the different types of peer review are, um, and sort of uh, the different scales on which they happen, um, whether it's, you know, sort of a very informal peer review when you ask your office mate to make sure you haven't spelled anything wrong or all the way up to the very formal level when you're submitting a manuscript or even potentially code for uh, publication. Um, and so we worked on outlining these things in a, a peer review chapter. She put together a lot of really great guidance specifically on peer review for journal articles and how to do that in an open and inclusive and supportive way. Um, and then I began outlining, but don't yet have a preview of uh, some of the process for the GitHub peer review uh, process. And then uh, and I also worked with Reshma and she'll present in a little bit. So I won't I won't spoil the surprise on the exciting things I got to work with um, her on as well. Um, but 
uh, some some more fun ideas and in, uh, chapter development. Well, thank you, thank you, Jessica. I mean, the review is one of these things that is always overlooked and when you get asked to review something, they don't give you any kind of guidelines. I've been into that. So thank you so much. That would be extremely, extremely helpful. Um, so the next one is Esther. Do you want to go, Esther? Yeah, sorry, just trying to find the right screen. So um, Ariel's already highlighted the research infrastructure role, uh, and I uh, based my data stewards overview based on her uh, community manager's overview. Uh, so it was super nice because I didn't have to think about what to tell. I just had to fill in the template. Um, so I basically provide an overview about what do data stewards do, which is not always the same for each role. Um, so yeah, it's quite diverse, but I guess that's also the case for all the other roles. So it's just illustrating that it's not just a role in, in that you can uh, explain in two sentences. Uh, we include some day-to-day -day tasks of a data steward, which I'm already looking forward to reusing later because people ask that question quite a lot. So I'm hoping that this section is super helpful to anyone considering this role uh, or trying to find out what you could use a data steward for yourself. Um, also some um, information about skills, qualifications, and I just basically tossed in all the resources uh, that I knew in the section and broke the reference list by doing that, but then figured out that there was some underlying problem in the reference list anyway, so we fixed that. That took uh, quite some time. I, I'm starting to see myself as more of an GitHub expert in the meantime, starting to get there. Um, and of course, some challenges and benefits of having data stewards. So, and then I just wrote down a case study. Very happy to have your input there, whether this is interesting or whether you're missing anything, because I just literally typed that out in one go, I think. And I think Ariel was too kind to comment on this, or she just wanted to have a case study out and she didn't want to scare me. So if you have any feedback on that, do please let me know. Uh, and other than that, I have been reviewing some wonderful pull requests and I'm very impressed with how everyone was getting along and um, yeah, doing so many things, which is very exciting to see. And I had amazing discussions and I very much enjoyed my week off of work or like actual data stewards work. And it was very nice uh, to catch up with everyone and to get to know some new people. So thanks very much. Thank you, Esther. I'm always inspired by the work that Esther does. I mean, I, I don't know how she managed to do all of that at the same time. And wow, amazing. Uh, the data steward thing is something that does not exist in many countries. I think it's like a new job that being, yeah. So when I try to say there's something called data steward to people here, they just don't understand it. And that kind of, yeah, explanation is very, very, very helpful. Um, so the next one is going to be Melissa. Melissa, you ready? Yes. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, we do. Perfect. All Thank right. you. Uh -huh. Thank you. So um, my goal for the week was to work on one of the sub-chapters sub in the remote collaboration chapter, which is part of the guide for collaboration. And it was supposed to be the one on tools for remote collaboration that currently looks like this. Um, so, you know, by having so many nice talks with people who shared the, the sessions, during the book dash, we ended up uh, coming to this conclusion that it would be a good idea to actually distribute these tools into the other subchapters here. It would make a, a little more sense maybe, but this is still under discussion on, on GitHub uh, in an issue. So uh, first I started with this HackMD where I was taking some notes, some comments here like this. And then we, with Kirsty, we ended up coming up with these ideas about where to move the content to. And then this is the, the pull request, still work in progress um, with what we were doing right towards the end of the book dash. There are still some things to be done, to be continued. And uh, 
today Batu did a great review too of um, about the work I was uh, I had already um, committed here, so I'm very thankful for that. And the so this is the chapter the sub chapter that I edited a little bit more too on managing distributed teams. It looks like this on the book, like many other sub chapters in this. Um, part of the guide about remote collaboration, it's organized into the bullet point structure, and then I made some suggestions to turn it into more like a text structure, structure with a few bullet points where it made a little more sense to keep them, and the tools are here currently on the bottom, but still up to editing. And I think it was very cool to see how ideas were metamorphosed. <laughs> we're like a metamorphosis uh, happened during the week with these ideas as I was uh, talking to other people and I think it was also very nice to have the session with the illustrator Katya uh, there were already some illustrations on, on remote collaboration but I think we came up with one that was a little bit different and I loved watching her creative process and everybody else's you know uh, book dash process as well. I think that's it. Thank you, Melissa. I was really extremely impressed when I was reading the chapter. Um, there's many tools that I mentioned, particularly the one about task management system, like a lot of these tools that I wasn't familiar with it myself. So it was very, very rich. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, Thank you. Too. Yeah, so I'm going to move to the next one, which is uh, Reshma. Right? Did I pronounce right? Um, yeah, Reshma is fine. Okay, <laughs> good. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, and okay, just to um, introduce myself briefly for people who don't know me, my name is Reshma Sheikh. I'm based out of New York. This is my first uh, book dash. I did join, I think it was a Jupiter Comms sprint in October of 2020. So I was sort of introduced to it back then. So I'm happy to um, return to this um, now. Um, so what I worked on with Jessica is um, we discussed at, um, adding a checklist and a section for um, tracking, for, uh, it says impact events chapter. So I guess measuring impact of events and um, we also discussed, um, uh, yeah, and could apply to projects as well, not necessarily just for in-person or online events, but projects as well. We also discussed where to add the chapter, and we had a discussion with, you know, there's, there's a few places that it could go in. It could go under guide for project design. It could go under guide for communication. And so we um, decided to put it under guide for project design and then cross post it connect it with guide for communication. So um, if we come back here, um, I can show what we did do. So there's a PR that was submitted and I'm just gonna get the smaller, okay. There's a PR that was submitted and um, it, see if I, I guess I can put this for you. Ah, okay. So it hasn't been merged in, but um, it's measuring impact of events and projects. And there's a summary. And um, oh, I think, sorry, I think this is the landing. This is just the template landing page. This is the actual checklist. So let me put this like this. Okay. Checklist for measuring impact. And so there are some. Um, suggestions for pre-event. So for instance, um, and I guess I have to come, I have to come back to this, but I guess what I would say is um, events begin at the time that they're just thought of in the conception phase, even though the actual event may happen, whatever, one, two, three, four months later. And um, maybe I can write that in the landing page, um, which I, I haven't touched the landing page area yet. But you know, the the information that such as the application process, if there is one, measuring prerequisite skills, measuring demographic information on potential participants. There's a lot of information on people on this stage before they get to the event, which is helpful. And then there's an event or a series of events. There's various ways to collect information, um, various ways to measure impact. Um, 
in terms of diversity, website traffic, who signs up, who, the attrition that goes along the way, um, social media, ways to collect it, which is surveys feedback and um, different ways to measure results. And this was actually inspired by a, um, um, this is something that we presented with coded for science and society people at the CSV conference, tracking impact and measuring success in data education events. Um, what's here is more of a, a checklist or just like various um, points in it. Um, and so I put um, the things that need to be done is, um, I think the formatting may not be 100% for this. Um, the landing page, I haven't started at all yet, but the template has been added. Um, cross posting it to the communications chapter and um, adding a drawing to it as well. Um, and um, yeah, that's, uh, that's sort of it. I don't know if anybody has any questions. Thank you, Rashma. I'm blown away with that. I think I'm going to start using that chapter when I organize uh, the session for our ladies. So thank you so much. If anyone got questions, we're going to go through the question at the very end. And we have two more people to present now. Marta, then I'm going to go to Lena. Okay, Marta. Yeah, I'm okay here. With... I'll uh, share my screen in a second. Yeah, take your time. No worries. Can you all see my screen? Yeah, we do. Okay, so I didn't really do much, to be honest, uh, because I started actually writing after the, um, the small discussion that we had. So initially the ideas that I jotted down were basically coming out of the discussion that we had. So for example, someone asked me about like the level of detail they should go into, how many, like how much, how much detail to present in a data visualization uh, figure and so on. So I tried to address editorial choices. Um, then I tried to like, these are all like bullet points that of course I would like to develop further. And uh, Emmanuel hasn't looked at it yet because she was traveling from what she told me, but I've just shared it with her. So she will also be able to see it. Then I want to talk about data accessibility from the point of view of um, cognitive and perceptual constraints which I thought, which is why I thought it was particularly interesting for me to collaborate with her because she has like a data science background and I have a psychology background. Uh, again, multidisciplinarity, so explaining how different like professionalities and how different profiles can contribute to, to the chapter. Uh, then I started listing down some tools. Uh, we also talked a bit about static, dynamic, and interactive charts. So this also was a section that I want to develop further. And then finally, I will also include websites and uh, resources. So again, this is just a draft, and I am looking forward to keep working on it, obviously. Um, I might also include some slides from my presentation, like re-elaborate some slides from my presentation in the, in the section. Thank you, Marta. Yeah, Thank slides you. would be slides would be awesome. Like uh, more drawing, and more illustrations. Thank you, Marta. That's Thank you. really, really, really amazing. Uh, I'm gonna move to now, Lena. Yes, sure. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I was working on the peer um, review. Uh, just a sec. I'll share my screen. So this this is a this is a preview that the chapter is not. Uh, published yet? Uh, yeah. yeah, I think that's, that's the right screen. Uh, so what what I did was I um, uh, I created a landing page for peer review, uh, which still needs to be populated with summary, motivation, and the uh, artwork. Uh, then uh, I I created the section on various types of, of peer review, which is supposed to bring together several things. For example, the classical journal peer review process, but also review of a pull request. And in general, this vision of peer review as collaboration and deep engagement with other person's work and not just a formal procedure and getting a stamp of uh, quality on your paper. 
And then uh, the part that I wrote was based on a blog post by Rene Beckers. And this is a guidelines for guide, a guidance for classical peer review. So if you are requested to do peer review for a journal, these are some guidance guidance you can follow to be um, like to write your review. So you, some things you need to consider before accepting the invitation, things you need to con consider while writing the review, how you can organize your work best. Uh, and that's all. Yeah, and then I have resources. I also did a small contribution to a documentation chapter, and I'm also looking forward to the artwork that came out of it. Wow, impressive, Lana. Wow, wow. Um, the review chapters, when, like the chapters I'm very, very excited about, so much excited about. So thank you so much, Lana and Jessica. Uh, so before I go to Malvika and Christy, is there anyone else that would like to share, but I forgot their name? Okay, so I'm gonna move to Malvika now. I think Christy. Thank you so much, Batul. I'm enjoying your sharing so much. You're incredible. Um, I really enjoyed uh, book dash as much as I could participate, but I was missing in a, in a lot of sense. What I am really excited about <laughs> is amount of uh, work I did or time I spent. Work was very little on releasing the new versions of the Turing Way. So the last version, as you can see, was released in 2019, and we hadn't released anything in between. Not because we didn't want to, because we had sort of a complicated workflow for um, making release. We have, now I'm gonna show you, we have over 300 contributors on the Turing Way GitHub repository. That meant that when we started the project with about, um, about 10 authors, it was much easy to do release in this way. So I'm gonna show you. You could add everyone's name, give them a git, give Orchid ID for each of them. However, when you have 300 people doing this requires a lot of time and also justification around who is author and who isn't author. So I just stalled it for as long as I could until we decided that we, we are going to use the Turing Way community as the author. So the current version that you would see is Turing Way community. And we'll also work on making sure that we have some ways to record contributors' name. However, that took a lot of work. Uh, as you would see, there were multiple PR that started from creating a citation CFF file that you would see as a citation file on GitHub, then creating a Zenodo.json file. And these were not a lot of work, except for we didn't know what we were doing, or what, what I didn't know what I was doing. So I was working with Achintya in telling what did not work. And uh, lots of messages around, oh, look at this, this is yellow, it might work, but it didn't really work. Uh, but eventually we got to a point where things made sense and thanks to Carlos, he pointed me to what I was doing wrong. And now that process has been recorded in a document, which is called Workflow for Releasing Different Versions. And we're planning to do it hopefully as frequently as possible. So anybody can probably use this for their own repository, but it's mostly for the Turing Way community to um, understand how our citation file looks like and how do we give um, release versions, what is patch minor and major versions, what information should go inside the document and how to publish it. So I'm really particularly excited about this because uh, this is something that everybody keeps asking. So we have a citation file and it's an order file. Uh, this is also still very much under preparation and uh, any improvement, uh, any suggestion would be really incredibly helpful. Another thing that I was trying to work on and didn't have enough chance to work on is um, creating a forward section. So if you go in the book, we have an afterward section which has record of contributors, bibliographic glossary, le legal disclaimer. There's a forward section that I wanted to work on, didn't have a lot of chance to work on. Uh, which should give you vision and mission and background about the project, um, our history, how to navigate the book. So mostly to tell people that don't read from beginning till end. So some good tips around navigating the book, what community and roles exist in the book, what ways of working we have. So I kind of worked a lot on the ways of working because it compiles all the links that we have scattered all over in the project. 
that people can find and uh, how they receive acknowledgement and so on. And notable impact is something that I would love to work on after Reshma and Jessica have finished their chapter, because that would be uh, super useful for us. Um, and that's about it. I had some really incredible chat with folks attending Bookdash and worked with Scriberia, coordinated with Scriberia, and really grateful for everybody for participating here. I can't possibly start to describe. I mean, yeah, I'm speechless. Uh, I love the cards and uh, uh, like, yeah, this is a new feature. Is it is a new feature? Wow. Yeah, I love this. <laughs> so good. Yeah, so nice. So I'm going to move to Christy. Uh, now. Yeah, just just before we do, um, Rachel has put a question in the in the chat of what does release mean for this project? Do you want to answer that real quick, Malvika? Yeah, I think so, Reshma, we want to follow the open source uh, workflow of how people do uh, frequent releases of their software. So just following that philosophy, we have like every, let's say every month, uh, average of 10 people contributing some part into the book. So when we release, we want to include them as authors and release the bits that have been added. Um, so in the past, th there was no like standardized way of what we call release and probably the part of confusion just really stopped us from releasing. So either we can agree on a timely release, let's say every month we have a time or every two months we have a time where we do an automated release or some sort of manual releases. Um, and Carlos actually helped me define what minor, major and patch called. So minor could be such as uh, if people during the period before previous release and current release have just done bug fixing, that could be a minor release. A patch could be when we are like creating new chapters. So there's like significantly more in introduction into the book. And the major should be when we've, let's say, done major reformatting of a chapter uh, or added a new guide or the guide have been moved around or you know something significant has changed into the project that doesn't reflect in the previous release. So this is what we call release. Uh, we've tried to you know, document this part, but I can imagine that still needs some teasing out. Yeah, I'll also just jump in on this and, and thank you so much, Malvika. It was really funny watching those, um, the Slack conversations of being like, it's done, it's not done. How about now? Still not done. Um, and I think the other, there's another element about one of, one of the elements of the Turing way is encouraging people to manage their data and manage their software in a responsible way, which includes archiving and version controlling the archive of your outputs. And so although people can cite sort of specific web links, if we have the versions archived on Zenodo, then uh, people can cite that. And one of the things that Zenodo does that I think is very, very cool is you can have a concept ID, which will always resolve to the most recent one. So if you're citing the concept or the project of the Turing way, you can cite that number. Um, but if you actually want to cite a specific version, bearing in mind that like the content of the book might change going forwards, um, you could actually cite like the specific version. And I don't think there will be that many examples of people needing to cite, you know, like those particular words because we're kind of a tertiary resource. So if they needed to really, really cite a finding, they would probably go to the original source um but it's there as an option which is really which is really nice so i um i think i said earlier i participated in the book in the book dash in between some other meetings and responsibilities this week i did end up joining on quite a few of my dog walks um which is fun in the morning and then really odd in the evening because it's so dark so early. So it was just a sort of black square with an occasional sort of uh, street lamp that would that would pass by on the screen. But I loved listening in. Um, I really, really enjoyed the, the collaborative conversation with Melissa about, she described it really well about sort of how do we make that those collaboration um, sections more accessible and more sort of searchable and findable. Um, I had a great conversation with Anka as well, thinking about kind of, how do we encourage people to get into a, a reproducible workflow mindset rather than sort of doing a top-down dictation of this is the workflow, this is the, these are the tools that you should use because 
because two things one is you know we we want to be careful to not be overly intimidating to people such that the perfect is the enemy of the good and and people feel that they can't even get started because it's so hard to sort of work all the way through but also recognizing that you you what you should do is pick the correct tool uh for the for the project that you have and and essentially when you're working with lots of different data it becomes very difficult to be overly specific about that but you can reflect at the beginning you can think about the provenance you can think about the different stages that you're working through um and that mindset is actually quite generalizable across lots of different projects so i really enjoyed that um I, the other, I think the only responsibility that I had this week, apart from occasionally turning up, um, was that I hosted our, um, our, our shared meal. So one of the things that was so fun about in-person book dashes is that we went out to dinner before we even started. So not even a celebration at the end. We went out for dinner the night before and we always had a wonderful time. We, we did uh, three, three book dashes in, in person before COVID um, joined, our, joined our world. And they were great fun. And we would take everyone out for a meal. We'd have some drinks and then we'd have a starter. We'd have a main course. And, you know, by that time, you've got, kind of got to know the people around you and you're having, you've, you've met some of your new colleagues and, and collaborators. And then in between the main meal and dessert we would ask people if they wanted to give a lightning talk and they they to my memory they had three minutes and they could talk about anything and some folks would talk about um the like a, an initiative that they had so whether they had you no know, woman in science initiative or um one person talked about how he was practicing learning his statistics and programming through uh, scraping sports scores from various different websites and then kind of compiling them and practicing some of the skills in that way. Uh, one of our participants gave a talk on Morris dancing and I didn't know that, that he knew anything about Morris dancing and I didn't know anything about Morris dancing. I think I gave a talk at some point about the competitions that I used to do with my dog um, for a sport called nose work, which is based on the practices of uh, drug and uh, explosive detection dogs. It's very, very fun. And so we've taken, we've taken that, that sort of, that excitement and that kind of learning about all of these, these amazingly interesting people and learning about the kind of a dimension of them, their lives that you might not know about into our shared meal, which happens on, on the Wednesdays of these virtual, um, these virtual book dash events. And so this time we, we don't put people on the spot quite so much because it's a different dynamic, uh, but we ask people to show and tell. So we ask people to bring something along and um, tell, us, tell us a little bit about it. And I, that was just a really, really beautiful um, session to, to spend with everyone. You, you learn things about the, the collaborators that are just mind blowing and so inspiring. And so I want to thank everyone very, very much for their participation in that. We also gave everyone um, a budget of 25 pounds to have a, a meal on us. Um, so if you are here and you participated in the book dash, um, if you have not yet spent your 25 pounds um, you should you should do that. You should grab some groceries, or you should get a nice takeaway and um, treat yourself on 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 us to say thank you very much for sharing sharing those um, parts of yourself and and all of the really fantastic work that you've contributed to the book and the project and the community so far. Thank you so much, Chrissy. Uh, thank you. <laughs> That's really lovely. To, uh, I think we do have a 10 minutes break, if I'm not mistaken now, right? So we're going to go into a 10 minutes break and then we will be back to show the illustration and Esther going to be the one who's going to present them, I believe. Okay, see you guys in 10 minutes. Here we go. So welcome back from the break. We're hoping everyone is back by now, because now is another very exciting part of 
this session is sharing the drawings that were made by Scriberia. Uh, so one of the things that we have during a book dash is a Scriberian artist who is drawing our very complex concepts and ideas into very nice drawings that are understandable, unlike our ramblings. Uh, and kudos to the artists trying to make sense of all of the stuff that we're doing uh, and making these wonderful images. So uh, this week we had Matt and Katya with us. And uh, I'm just going to go through these drawings that they made for us with uh, some of the Turing Way community members. Uh, and then if you see your drawing popping up, feel free to interrupt me and tell the story behind the drawing, because uh, I'm sure you'll do a better job at telling the story behind your drawing than I'll do. Uh, so I'm not sure if Alejandro is in this call. Yeah, I am here. Sorry, you hear some background noise. It's my wife that is doing remote teaching, but I hope that you understand. My, this illustration is for... Uh, particular project that uh, I'm working also with Kisti and it is trying to have good practices in the environmental uh, science, uh, basically with the data science in particular. So I would like to have some elements that in on one side we have the researchers that have super good skills, but they don't know how, how to uh, like make their codes more like uh, charitable to regular people who are not good in coding. So I'm working uh, in this particular project that we call the environmental library to help the researchers to have this kind of uh, help and make their code more uh, reposable, scalable, and shareable, and thanks to the Turing way because it's a, gra a great guy to to plan to have to play this kind of <laughs> stuff also for the environmental science. So thank you. Sorry <laughs> for the noise. <laughs> Thank you so much for explaining the drawing. And it's, it's just lovely to see how the drawing is actually kind of applicable to that as well, where you're trying to make it more understandable for others as well. So it's, it's a nice double meaning. Let's see if I can go to the next one. Slow internet. I think I might have skipped one. No, I think it's good. Okay, on peer review, I think this one got entered from the last session, actually. Uh, Lena, can you maybe hop on? Oh, it's interesting because I think ours was uh, like a comics of three parts, right? This is the final part. Yeah, I think so. So maybe we'll just go through the other images until we have the comic of three part, and then you can tell the full <laughs> the story. Part. Then I'm not sure who made this one. Yeah, so I think Katia has been still finishing some stuff. It's really amazing. And uh, it's a very tiring thing to do. And I have to go back and tell her that this is <laughs> a very tiring way indeed. Uh, so this is Kirsty, actually. Kirsty and I worked on a couple of images on telling the stories of uh, the Turing way. Does she want to take this one? Yeah, so the, the original, uh, the origin story of the Turing Way is that the Turing Institute um, was awarded a 38 million pound um, investment and the, it was, in, it was uh, awarded that money in 2018 and in 2018, the UK was also making a, a horrible life choice of leaving the European Union. And so the, um, the politicians and the government uh, took quite a long time to tell <laughs> to tell the Turing Institute that they had um, that they had received this money, but it still needed to be spent by the end of the financial year. So each uh, fifth, it was a five year investment. And so each fifth needed to be spent by the end of that financial year. And so a few of us were asked to come up with ideas that could be um, put in place quite quickly, deliver impact, <laughs> and spend 12 months of money in six months. And so I went to give a, a talk to some um, students uh, in Berlin and that was a really fun talk. And then after the talk, I went to a coffee shop and it turned out that there were no laptops allowed on Saturdays. So I had a delicious cup of coffee and had my colorful pens with me. And I drew out three different ideas that I put forward as um, 
open science and open source um, projects that I thought would fit with this. And one of those was funded and that was the tiring, <laughs> the Turing, the Turing way. And so this, um, what we were trying to get across with this illustration is kind of me having this sort of idea in a little coffee shop in Berlin somewhere, um, but designing the project from the very beginning to unfold and unravel and um, develop as we bring people in. And so it's a sort of, it was never designed to be a project that would be completed or that would be sort of well-defined, I suppose. It was always designed to be a project that would respond to the needs of the users and the contributors and the, the community that we were bringing together. Thanks so much for highlighting that story. And as soon as you said it's Kirsty, I was like, all right, this is the Berlin coffee thing. So it's very recognizable. Just I needed a clue because it's it's Friday evening and it's tiring and yeah. <laughs> very nice typo. Let's see if I can go to the next one. Oh, you're up again. Yeah, this is a continuation of the story. Um and uh, Katya has drawn a couple of versions of this. And in this, Kirsty and I are taking our personal path, personal journey in the Turing way. Um, and uh, our idea was to make sure that the path is not singular, path isn't straight, path could be your personal story, your experiences, and whatever you bring into the Turing way. And uh, yeah, I think she did an incredible job. I don't think that's how we imagined, but this is really wonderful. Yeah, I love this image. Very nice. Also love this image. I'm not sure if Ankur is on this call. I thought so. Do you want to uh, explain or shall I just do it? I'll just start and if you want to take over, feel free to interrupt. Um, but this is an image for a reproducible analysis pipeline. Uh, and this image was, I think, uh, causing a headache for Katya, who had to learn, uh, had a crash course in reproducible analysis uh, in only uh, minutes, basically, where other people can uh, take full degrees on it. And so they uh, described all these elements that are needed for a reproducible analysis pipeline uh, as little puzzle pieces. And I think they've, re yeah, they've really captured that very well. But I think this, this was one of the most difficult images to do for this week. So uh, yeah, very much appreciate what, how Katya has uh, done that so super clearly. Then the next one, I'm not entirely sure. Okay, no one, no one is jumping in. So I'm just gonna let you enjoy this image on communication, not just to society, uh, but with society. We're not just here to uh, let, like be on top of the society and just educate them uh, because we can definitely learn from what society has to offer. I really, I just, sorry to just jump in. I really like this uh, megaphone being like, appreciate this learning. Um, <laughs> I like the aggression of it. So yeah, I don't know who, who designed this, but it's it's really lovely. It's amazing. <laughs> right, this one, we do have a couple of people on the call who can maybe explain this better than I. Uh, okay, I can, I can go. Uh, that's okay with Andrea and Alejandro. So this is also trying to explain the concept of translation management system, which is a bit different than the traditional translation, which basically use something called translation memory, which means you can take um, translation from different projects and related to project and still attach it to your project. So it does remember how these vocabulary being translated before in different project, and you can share it with your own project. It does also use the glossary, so you can define uh, the translation for specific terms, uh, and this makes sure that everything is consistent when you do the translation, because open source vocabulary, for example, 
sometimes some of it in you. So when volunteers come to translate it, some of them will translate it in a specific way, whereas others will translate it in a totally different way. There is also quality check. There is machine translation, which means you can use Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, a lot of ABI to help you within the translation. And it does integrate with the GitHub and does also show the community how they yeah, volunteer and use all these uh, components within the translation management system. Yeah, that's pretty much it, yeah. Thank you. I think that's a lot. <laughs> that's pretty much it. But yeah, it's a lot. It's amazing work. Thanks so much, Dean. Ooh, we already done this one. So I'm going to try and see. Right. This one is from a logo, which I am so going to mispronounce. So I'm going to ask either Kirsty or Malfika to explain this one again. Sorry. I can jump in with this one. So this is a citizen science project called Ort Spaces. Um, which is the purpose of the project is to collect together autistic people's experiences of navigating a sensory environment outside of their home. Uh, so examples might be that it's difficult for autistic people who have sensory processing differences or sensitivities to take the tube at rush hour because it's very noisy, people might be more likely to touch you. Um, and it, it also can be difficult to work in open plan offices, um, potentially in places where the lights are very bright, things like that. And so um, Sophia, who is working in, within that project, wanted is thinking about the design of the website that we're building. And um, she wanted to incorporate a motif and the motif has um, a rainbow of colors and also the infinity sign, both of which are a sort of have been used by the neurodiversity community to kind of try and get across that you can be neurodivergent in lots of different ways, that it's a spectrum and it's multidimensional um, rather than kind of a line that sometimes think the, aut or the autism spectrum is a, is a sort of line and you move kind of incrementally along it in different ways, but actually it's this very much more multidimensional space. And so that's why the infinity symbol is there and that's why we've got the, um, the rainbow colors in there as well. Yeah, I think that's very amazing. At, at some point I'll remember the name of the project, Art Spaces. Yes, that's right. And actually I have to say it stands for something. This, the AUT stands for autism and then spaces stands for something, but I, we just call it AUT spaces and I always have to look it up if I'm ever going to give a talk and I haven't looked it up in a little, bit, in a little while. Sorry about that, but then you do make me feel a little bit better about me <laughs> forgetting, <laughs> but it's a beautiful logo and uh, it's especially special for this series because this is the only image who, that has more than one color featured, so it's very special. Then publishing reproducibly, and I think I saw Emma on the call, so if you could maybe explain this one a little bit. It does need a bit of change because she's missed out code. So what I was trying to reproduce was the, the diagram from the computational reproducibility paper um, about um, moving from not reproducible to reproducible sort of publishing. So we had the idea of having the spectrum that has a rainbow and going to a pot of gold at the end, which is your reproducible output, really. So it needs it does need a bit of adjustment, this one. It needs a an extra cloud which says code um so can we speak to capture about that to put it in yeah so we'll get that put in there but yeah i think it looks quite nice yeah it looks lovely apart from the code then anyway yeah, it's in code but we won't we'll remember that <laughs> <laughs> and the next one ariel if you would like to say something about this one Hello, yes, this is um, the one that we're hoping to use for the research, the overall research infrastructure roles, um, sort of chapter heading. Uh, the idea was to reuse some of the motifs that we've seen um, used in other places. Uh, so the data stewards, um, there's uh, Esther did one um, that has a, a great train um, metaphor and bridge building metaphor. Um, I know that Malvi did one on community managers kind of helping people out of silos. And last round we had um, one on the Rams, like uh, helping people in 
sort of build windows into knowledge and use stuff. Um, and so, the, yeah, the idea is that, um, you know, the, these are the research infrastructure roles who are essentially helping to construct the research, the research environment um, that uh, people work in. Um, and so they're very much part of uh, the in landscape and not sitting outside it, but kind of in there and, and helping build it. And um, yeah. Thank you. Very nice image indeed for the chapter. And we saw that one. I think we have a couple of doubles. Right, this one. I think Emma, was that yours? This is the one that is Ed's diagram. So it's, it's on the, this one is a little bit of tweaking, but it's basically on the, it's showing the two sort of different ways of using data safe haven. So the one on the left is using, having the data inside, but actually constructing your research on the outside as you go. So bringing the code out and the results out so that you can actually construct it along the way. And then the one on the right is actually working within the data safe haven all of the time and sort of I think Ed's idea is that it um as you if you do it if you build it as you go along it sort of um helps you in the end when you're publishing your research that's why this one on person on the right is looking like oh I've got so much more work to do um yeah so it's kind of going from his very schematic diagram into something a bit more um uh, I can't think of the word but yeah like yeah. It was it was Ed's idea to do it like this, so I like it. Yeah, very nice. The explanation does make it a bit more clear what you what it's trying to get. Yeah, I think it needs a bit more labels. I think that's what I sent it to Ed to show him, and I think it just needs a little bit more labeling to make it a bit clearer. But yeah, the idea is generally there. Yeah, that might be uh, might be a good idea. I think Kasia did say that she find this one, she found this one also tough to do, so <laughs> we gave her a very hard time. Oh dear. Right, then this is the documentation one. Lena. Uh, yeah, this is documentation. And uh, we have um, like we have a section on uh, documentation and metadata. And I always find that documentation and metadata are topics that are very difficult to explain and to address. So I was very keen on having some kind of artwork yeah. that could uh, help. So what we came up with actually Esther was uh, uh, was inspiring me and uh, Kirsty as well. Uh, that the documentation kind of helps you to light the road, to put light on the road. So the, 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 this person is setting uh, lamps, which you can also see as chunks of documentation. And this makes it possible for others to walk the road. So then you can see a poor person in the dark lost and you can also see this as your, your, self, your future self without documentation, you might end up lost in this darkness. So you can interpret it as just helping somebody lost or what if you don't do this, then this is what this is what will happen. Very good fairy tale. I think uh, your images are, are having a fairy tale Im uh, element. It's very nice. Well, you started all this all with saying you want a dragon. That's true. There were no real dragons though, only like a Godzilla one that's going to come up at some point. Um, spoiler, uh, this one is uh, one that's made by research software engineers. Um, Farouk and Abel made this one uh, to highlight the contributions of research software engineers which uh, or researchers that are working with codes. Uh, this is quite a lot of work. Uh, it takes a lot of time, a lot of debugging, uh, and then you don't really get that much recognition sometimes when uh, researchers are not valuing this as much as publications, for example. And this uh, image is trying to highlight that uh, using software citation is a way for research software engineers or people working with codes to also receive recognition for all of their work. And I very much love the stars here. And I'll go a little bit quicker. Um, this one is also for 
software citation, uh, basically highlighting how you can get credit using the CFF file. And that's been a chapter that they've contributed during this book dash and can highly recommend having a look at that, getting your uh, credits. This one is on remote collaboration. I don't think we have. I, I was yes. asking for, for that. <laughs> Wonderful. For that illustration. Yeah, so I started with the idea of people doing more like uh, informal interactions through those polls. Uh, you know, like icebreaker questions, things like that. So I had pictured people like happily interacting from their remote places. And then we ended up going on with this idea of a uh, table and you bring something to the table. And Katja did this brilliant uh, version with the geotags and it's so cute. And uh, even the baby helping <laughs> with, the, with the chicken. I asked her to include a baby because so many people are in that situation working remotely. And um, also this idea that um, instead of shutting off or shutting down, I don't know, uh, differences, they should be, you know, like if, if people want to, to bring them to the table, that's a place for a congregation and, and I don't know, in, interacting, uh, including your differences and your particularities. Yeah, I love this image. This is so nicely done. I think this is one of my favorites. I'm not going to say the favorite because I think they're all very wonderful. Okay, Lena, you're up again <laughs> with the peer review. Yes, this, time this is peer stuff. review. And yes, as you said, we are we are in the fairy tale uh, mode here. Actually, this was uh, created together with Jessica Shaik. And um, the idea was to um, uh, to show the, 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 the big bad wolf as the reviewer number two. So you can see in the first stage, uh, the, the piglet is starting to build the house, like the project. And the other piglet says, no, look, that like this will not uh, hold against reviewer number two. Uh, you can see this very this scary big bad wolf um, and, uh, in their discussions. So other piglets start helping. And this is also the idea that the review process is not just this formal review that you are bouncing ideas uh, against your peers and peer review starts already much, much earlier. That then the step two, the, the whole community is helping to build a bigger house and then uh, a better house. And then the reviewer, the wolf reviewer steps in and he actually says, I want you to do it even better. So he's not against the, the pigs. He wants an even better house so that they can all hide from the storm. So this is this um, this very last picture. I'm not sure the storm is uh, clearly understood the storm, but you can see that they are also happy together with a brick house. And I guess that's, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, I love this image. Very nicely done. Okay, we've done this one. Ah, this is uh, the closest we're going to get to dragons. Uh, this is a visualization of how commercial infrastructures or commercial parties are the big baddies trying to eat all of our data, money, everything. Well, we could also work around it or work under it. Uh, basically directly communicate our results um, and all of our stuff to the public without actually using them. But it seems to be very difficult to actually get people to do that. Um, but yeah, that's what this image is about. And indeed it's like little Godzilla's. That's the, that was the idea. And this is the one for the fireside chats. Do we have time for Kirsty to elaborate on this? I think uh, I think Emma Emma designed this one, so maybe Emma, do you want to do you want to take it forward from here? Well, really, we had a chat chat about it before, so actually, I think Matt just went away with it. He was quite fascinated by it, and uh, to be honest, it was from his mind. But I think that looks like you walking in, doesn't it, with a marshmallow on your stick? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think so. It yeah. looks like me in my in my gilet, my uniform mm. that I wear all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so I'll I'll just say. Um, for anyone that's joining and if you haven't been part of the um we had one fireside chat so far and we're going to start to have some more and they're a they're a sort of informal space to have a bit of an interesting discussion they're not quite as formal as you know having some slides and giving a talk 
Um, and one of the things that, so this was Malvika's idea, but one of the things that I'll highlight that I'm really excited about looking forwards into 2022 is I think we'd really love to have some of these conversations across communities. So if any of you here um, think that it would be interesting to have two people from two different communities kind of chat with each other, you know, there's so many people in this space who are working in a, in a very aligned way. And so we want to kind of, not require people to do double the work or triple the work if they're sitting across multiple communities, but actually see how the work um, overlaps with each other. So if you think of any pairs of people or you know triads of people that you would like to, to chat with each other, um, please let us, let us know and we'll keep those conversations going. Thank you. Then this one is moving from uh, authorship to contributors. Emma, if you could very briefly elaborate, sorry. This is just to go with the academic authorship um, chapter that was released a bit earlier this year, because um, it, it had a sort of placeholding picture that was acknowledgements and that this really reflects the chapter that we're sort of thinking that authorship is a bit outdated and we want to acknowledge all the contributors and I gave Matt the credit taxonomy so if you see the the building there is actually part of the credit taxonomy that he's used to give the different sort of contributions which is which is really nice yeah it's a wonderful image super nice work I'm just interrupting again to say I heard from a um, doctoral student today at the Turing Institute who has already sent that chapter to the principal investigator of a new collaboration that he's joining and the principal investigator found it very useful. So that was a little joy in my, uh, it's always lovely to hear that people are actually reading this and, and finding it useful, but I wanted to feed that back to Emma who, who collaboratively sort of spearheaded that chapter going forward. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is an image for the data stewards, and I already highlighted the role of the data steward earlier, so this is a little bit of a visualization for that. I'm just going to skip that a little bit. Uh, this one is basically saying that there's no replacement for connections between people, and that is very true. I don't think Vicky is here, but here is a very nice image uh, of a post-it card on why you should share your work. And do have a look at that later because the details are very incredible. And I think this is also one of the nicest image from this batch. Then I am not entirely sure who made this one. I made this one, but I'll quickly just say, I think it's, uh, so we wanted to talk about why people are not replaceable in the digital and research infrastructure. And we believe that a lot of things can be automated within a group and can be siloed, but there are people who are needed to break these silos to make sure the communication across things are happening. This could be community managers, this could be research application managers, this could be anybody who loves talking to each other. So I think Matt did really incredible work. And we also discussed a little bit around why these kind of uh, collaborations are important to ensure that we are transparent. We are thinking about human rights. We're talking about social justice in the research work. We're making sure that we can communicate what community needs and what expertise is access, not just within the research, but also with the users. So I'm really, really uh, happy with this. Yeah, very nice. Oh, and this one uh, was another one that Vicky made about uh, the multiple pathways of open uh, access publishing, which is very complicated, needlessly so, um, but is a very nice image. We do seem to have a train um, reference. And then this one, maybe Malvika or Kirsty, if you want to elaborate. Yeah, I can do this one. So this is um, distinguishing between um, what people might think, they might have a sort of internal definition of the concept of collaboration. And one of the things that Malvika and I in multiple conversations with lots of different people have been sort of teasing apart is that some people might want to come along and help uh, and 
what that probably looks like is to be given quite a concrete task that's very achievable, that can be completed, and it's and it's quite a sort of um, singular contribution. Um, you might have a, a group of people who are cooperating together. And so they will have individual goals. They'll have individual skill sets and individual um, responsibilities. And one of the things that I said to um, the artist was that they really stay in their lane inside of a, 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 um, a cooperative project. So you don't try and like help the other people do their thing. You just line up all of the tasks and you sort of make them happen. And what Marvika and I and many of you here get excited about with thinking about what a collaboration is, is that there's really much more of a sort of um, learning together, talking with each other, sharing skills and being quite creative in thinking about what the shared goal is that everybody is working towards. And so we've got this um, more modern kind of uh, and diverse farm on the far right hand side there's a little uh, robot that's doing some of the um, apple picking we've got some bees going on to help with the pollination and it's thinking much more on like an ecosystem level rather than kind of individual uh, either individual tasks or individual um, delegations inside of a, a larger project yeah super nice image can you maybe link the blog post again that this image was based on? Yes, yes, I will do. I've still got it open. Thank you. And another train track on dealing with sensitive data. Yeah, this is Maria and my one for the sensitive data uh, overview. So yeah, Matt, we were going with the whole train train <laughs> analogy because it's just it's just quite cool I think I really like this so we had the idea of sensitive data being uh going on a different route but coming back to the same reproducible research is what we wanted to um to show is that actually reproducible research is possible with sensitive data uh, and this one needs a little tweak because it says open data and that should say open code I think that instead is what um Maria and Maria, Maria wanted to be there so, but yeah. yeah, so the different carriages are the different types of sort of um, uh, things that you can choose to do with your sensitive data. So it's like your choice of what to do in the different carriages. So yeah, I think it looks lovely. Yeah, really nice image. Very important point as well. Um, this one is about appreciating differences and different values. And it, it's part of the collaboration chapter, if I remember correctly. And it's, yeah, it's just very wonderful, but also we ran out of time. So I'm gonna stop sharing, unfortunately. And you'll have to watch the recording of the other session to see the full uh, story behind this one, um, because uh, Nina does a better job at explaining it than I do. And- the images will be uh, available uh, after Katja has done all the final tweaking <laughs> and then they'll be on the regular space uh, on Zenodo and then uh, freely to reuse for everyone under a CC BY license, which is absolutely amazing. Thank you so much, Esther. I can't believe that we're end of two hours. Generally, they don't take this long, but I think you know all of you have done such incredible amount of work and the illustrations this time is quite like detailed so definitely kudos to everyone who's here so we probably don't have enough time for detailed question and answer um, but we can definitely spend like a couple of minutes to just explore what question exists and make sure that you are connected with us so we come back and answer that so with that i'm going to stop recording thank you once again everybody and uh, just 